Uh, Witz and Vana, the floor is yours. Yeah. How's it well about? Done. How's it? Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk to you about coastal landscape transition, and that actually aligns quite well with, uh, with polder to seas, of course, because that, that's also a transition from a, from a polder to a sea. Um, before we can get going, I would very much also like to acknowledge my co authors, uh, Vana, and also doing Terpstra. Couldn't make it today. Um, as at University of Applied Sciences, we are a uh, higher education and applied research institute. We have two campuses, uh, one in Vlissingen and one in Middelburg. Uh, we have roughly 5,000 students and, and 25 bachelor programs. And since two years, we also run a master's program on uh, ri river delta development. Um, we consider ourselves the personal university. Um, with lots of attention for uh, the individual students. And a key concept that we have is that education is research and research is education. So they're actually really well, at least that's the ambition, intertwined. Um, we have 10 research groups and they are based around three main themes. And those themes are water, energy, and bio-based economy and food. And uh, well, you can have a look at the, the, the research group that we currently run, but they vary from water technology to bio waste construction and also Delta power. Um, and Vana and myself, we represent the Building with Nature research group. Um, you'll recognize Vana and myself also on, on, the, on, the, la uh, on the left. Um, but these research group, they are um, headed by, um, well, professors and ours are um, Joost Stronghorst and uh, to some of you probably familiar, Chiet Bauma as well. Um, and on the list, list on the left, you see also uh, Tim van Ooyen, who's our ecologist, and Vincent Bax, who's focusing more on the societal side of things. And we use these expertise in physical, ecological, and societal processes to study sustainable delta management, um, we also focus on climate-proof coastlines, and we look at environmental-friendly infrastructure. And traditionally, that has been looking at uh, hard infrastructure, but we see more and more um, solar platforms and also wind farms um, providing hard infrastructure, and they also provide opportunities for ecology. So this is essentially our mode of operation. Um, there's a, a field or a region, and for us, that's the Southwest Delta in the Netherlands. And um, there's a range of research questions and also urgent challenges. Um, we work with professionals in the field to articulate what, what the exact question is that then um, results in projects or programs or living labs or field labs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and then we do applied research on them. And uh, what, what, is, what is also key in the concept of uh, HSAT is that we then try and link to the best of our abilities to the different educational programs that we have. So we try to embed the findings of the research in our educational curricula, um, but we also try and to, to the best of our ability to involve our students in the research that we do. And I think the Polter to Seas project is a really good example of that project. Um, and also the themes that we're going to work on in the next couple of weeks will hopefully help and better do that. Um, so what I want to focus on today is the topic of managed realignment. Essentially, what is it uh, and how it also relates to estuary management and processes. Um, some concepts and some theory, and then I also want to take you to an example project. I mentioned here two, but I've, I, I want to focus today on the paddock polder project. And I want to look specifically on the physical and ecological findings of the project and how that actually could um, learn us something also in the context of the Head River Prosper project. So what is real managed realignment? It is essentially an ecosystem or soft engineering coastal management approach. Um, it's sometimes also referred to as setback or depoldering in, in a Dutch context. And it essentially involves relocating the line of the primary defense landward. And that is essentially what a natural coastal system would do during periods of sea level rise. And um, that's also what's going to happen in the Hedwig Prosper, of course, it's the current process and the setback in the Hedwig Prosper is, well, depending a little bit on the, on the, on the side of the boundary or one and a half kilometer to two kilometers. Now, why do we do this, right? What, what, what is the motivation and what is the benefit to these kind of um, uh, managed realignment projects? And well, they, they are um, primarily motivated by ecological functioning as well as climate adaptation. Um, and it's a response to the poor ecological functioning of many estuaries globally. Um, 
for the hate for the head legal prosper. Specifically, it is it is of course a nature compensation measure for the expansion of the animal farmer. In addition, uh, it allows for the formation of new tidal flats and salt marshes. And these tidal flats, flats and salt marshes, they are a host of ecosystem services. And then you can think of a, a nursery uh, for small animals, uh, rare habitats creating that, that, that are quite uh, unique in, in these um, uh, uh, estuaries. And uh, they are also a host to a unique rate, range of uh, species. Um, some of the benefits, um, but they're still very much discussed, is um, that these kind of projects also uh, result in lower costs compared to upgrading the primary defenses. Um, and they are also a stimulus for recreation. I think that's also one of the, let's say, big priorities for this, uh, for this project as well. Um, HPP is not the only project, of course. Uh, if you are already uh, only looking at the Southwest Delta, uh, we have, of course, the Hedwig of Prosper uh, here in, uh, well, close to the Antwerp Harbor. Um, but there's also Paddock Polar, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides, a little bit more detail. And um, there's Ramagors in the Eastern Scheldt, and for example, also closer to the North Sea, the Waterduren project. Um, but it's also not a uniquely uh, Dutch or Belgian thing. There are also projects uh, in, in the UK, Germany, Belgium, Spain, United States. Um, but overall, I think we can say that these are generally limited in size and also in scope. So it's not a, let's say, a, a, a strategy that's underlining these, these projects. Um, Management realignment is actually quite complex. There's many factors that are relevant to it. Um, so I think it all starts with the geophysics, right? So waves, tide, sediment, topography, bathymetry, they, they have a big role to play. And the history of the site and how it has been managed previously is really important. And then you can think of elevation, land use, um, but also the breach design and the placement is really important in how the essentially the area is going to develop. Chemical factors are really crucially important. And then you can think of water and sediment quality, uh, pH, salinity. And that, of course, in turn has, has an impact and feed, feeds into the ecological development of the area in terms of vegetation, microfauna. Um, and I think what we sometimes tend to forget is that the socioeconomic side, so the societal side of things, is maybe even the most important. So how does the, the public uh, perceive these kind of projects? How can we educate them? Um, and I think it's really important that also in Work Package 2 that we have a, a really big focus on this. Um, now, what I want to do here in this, in this uh, presentation is, is, is um, zoom out a little bit. Um, and see how this actually relates to some of the project, the processes and dynamics of the, the Western Scout or the Scout system more generally. Um, it's a very dynamic environment, of course, uh, with tides, uh, movement of sand and mud, and the continuous reshaping of, of the channels and the bars. At the same time, there's also a lot of economic activity. There's at least three main harbors um, on, let's say, the the, the, the land sites, there's also um, a lot of agricultural ac activity with many different land uses and also different products that are being produced. And there's, of course, also a range and a diversity of natural areas and recreation opportunities. And I think uh, one that is really close to the Hedwig of Prosper is, of course, the drought land of Saftingen. That's quite a unique area, of course. So there's a, a, a diverse range of, let's say, stakes and also uses of this scaled area. Um, this is quite a complex uh, figure. There's a lot to say about it, and I, I don't want to go in too much detail, but essentially the key message here is that uh, we're working at the transition from the terrestrial to the marine environment, and that's a hugely dynamic area, probably one of the most unique and dynamic areas um, on the globe. And there's a lot of changes over there, uh, changes in energy sources, uh, going from a, a river system to a uh, marine system and everything in between. And um, that has effects on sediment type and sediment transport. Also salinity changes from, of course, uh, totally fresh in the, in the river system to saline and, and, and different ranges of wreckage in between. Um, on top of that, chemical process uh, vary greatly along this transition. And also that has an impact, of course, on the biological process in terms of the vegetation and the animals that we see along this transition from the terrestrial to the marine environment. 
So that's something that is happening, let's say, at a slightly bigger scale uh, in, in the scale system. Um, this is a, let's say, a trend of cargo traffic to Edward Harbor over time. So what you see on the horizontal axis is the time and the cargo traffic in tons on the uh, vertical axis. And essentially what we see is that it's going up. And to facilitate that, actually, the ship sizes have gone up. Um, the figure actually runs on the early 2000s, um, so it should be updated, but pretty sure that the trend uh, continues. But to facilitate that, of course, we need to uh, do a lot of dredging activities. Uh, and that is, that is really important in managing shipping traffic. Um, and that is done to maintain an open and navigable uh, main channel. I think um, most of you have actually been, of course, to the to Hedwig of Prosper. And we'll have seen a lot of dredging activities on the main channel to keep it to keep it open. So it's a really crucial and important activity. Um, the dredging, of course, has a substantial and significant effect on how the tides and specifically the tidal range have developed in the Skelt estuary. So what you see here is uh, a plot of the average high water in the in the top panel and the average low water in the bottom panel for a number of tidal stations located in the Skelt estuary. And they're plotted over time, starting in the, let's say the 50s until 2000. And what you see is an increase of the average high water for all of the stations and a decrease of the average low water. And the effect of that is an increase in the tidal range. For example, in Antwerp, that was uh, 4.38 meters in 1895. Uh, that went up to 5 meters 20 in 1995. And the current tidal range is 5, 30, 5 meters 39 centimeters. And that actually amounts in a, well, that, that, was a, that represents a 23% increase in tidal range since 1895. So that is really a significant increase that is in part due to uh, the dredging activities. Uh, this is, however, not unique. Um, to the scale system. This is the tidal evolution for five European ports plotted uh, from a paper by Winterwerp and co authors in 2013. So, what you see here is the tidal range on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And these are, let's say, five European ports um, that are also highly maintained and kept open um, for, for shipping. And uh, essentially, we see for all of them to a greater or lesser degree that the tidal range has gone up. And this, of course, has for all of these uh, major ports and the cities that are actually located there, major implications for water safety. Um, not only does it have implications for water safety, it also has big, um, uh, big implications for the ecological functioning. Um, so what we see as part of this dredging is, a, is, is a, essentially a narrowing, a deepening, and also a smoothing of the estuaries. And because of the smoothing, there's a, which, was result, which is a result of the loss of intertidal areas, um, and that, is, that has uh, historically, they, well, they have historically been converted to, uh, to polders. Um, so what you see here on the left is a, essentially a, a conceptual diagram of the process that been happening, but um, the ships have essentially been 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 enlarged. Um, more deepening has happened. Uh, reduced uh, river flushing that has resulted in tidal amplification. So essentially, the tidal ranges have gone up, as I've just shown in the previous slide. That has resulted in an increase in the tidal asymmetry, um, increased pumping of mud. Um, so more and more mud has remained in the estuary. And that has resulted in a reduction of the hydraulic drag. Uh, and that essentially then amplifies uh, the tidal range again. So it's, it's essentially a self-enforcing uh, mechanism. Um, so the implication of that is that there has happened a regime shift to a hyper-turbid state for some estuaries. Uh, for example, in the Ems Dollard in the, in the north uh, of the Netherlands uh, in, in, with the border to Germany, that has clearly happened. Um, the skelt has also shown an increase in turbidity, but hyperturbid condition, conditions are uh, very unlikely, it is deemed now. Um, but of course, the 
the, the increase in turbidity has big implications for the ecological functioning because essentially it, it, it is becoming darker for the ecology. Um, so in short, to wrap up this, let's say, context bit, um, the current or ongoing projects um, in, in terms of ministry alignment are primarily motivated by nature compensation. Um, but ministry alignment in general has important benefits for water safety and ecological function, looking at the estuary scale. Um, for example, the HVP could serve as a water reservoir during flood, and that already leads to a reduction of the high water in Antwerp of about in the order of about 10 centimeters. And that is then, of course, counteracting the trend that we've just sketched where the tidal ranges are going up. Um, additionally, it also creates um, increased in the tidal area in the Skelt S3. And by doing so, that adds hydraulic roughness, slowing the tidal wave. And by slowing the flow, also the deposition of fine sediment is stimulated. And sediment deposition then, of course, leads to land level rise. And that, of course, is a bonus in terms of climate adaptation ability. Um, on top of that, it also creates unique and rare habitats for ecology. So there's multiple benefits of these kinds of projects in terms of water safety and also ecological function. Um, so that's the context that I just wanted to sketch. Um, we have had the opportunity to actually be involved in a paddock polder and also a Ramakos project. And I just want to share some of the key findings that we have had as a consortium that can probably also benefit the consortium uh, looking at, uh, at, at the Het Liefer Prosper. Um, so essentially, Paddock Polder has had the same transition from a freshwater agricultural area, a polder, to currently a saline natural environment. Um, we've done research with, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Rijkswaterstaat, the NEOS, uh, Wageningen University and Research, and also Deltaris. Um, Perk Folder is actually really quite close by uh, Het Prosper. So if you're nearby, I would very much like want, want to encourage you to actually have a look over there because I think it's quite interesting. Um, it's 75 hectares, so it's a, a, quite a bit smaller than, uh, than the Hedwig of Prosper. And it was also uh, done as a nature compensation as part of an extension of the waterway to Antwerp Harbor. Uh, and what you can actually see, so the red line here is essentially the dike before the breach. And then the yellow line actually represents the, the current area uh, that is twice daily flooded now. Uh, and we've done monitoring with the consortium between 2015 and 2018 in terms of the evolution of the morphology of the groundwater, of vegetation, and also of the benthic, so the bottom uh, communities. And I just want to share some highlights. Um, first, starting with the groundwater system, this was done. That was this was work that was done by uh, Deltares. And what they did is actually they installed a seep cat. Um, um, a measure. That's a mitigation measure that was installed to protect essentially the freshwater lens that is used by farmers for irrigation. Uh, and what they found actually is that the SEEPCAT system was functioning well enough to compensate for the saltwater intrusion effects of the new tidal area. So essentially the saline water did not uh, prograde further into the freshwater area and the farmers could still continue to use the land as they did. Uh, numerical modeling, however, suggests that this is only a temporary uh, trend and that over time salinity will increase also in the nearby area. Um, essentially, this is also uh, used as a field laboratory to, affect already, to test already the effects of, uh, of sea level rise and how we can adapt to that in these um, so, uh, areas that are going to uh, be salinized in, in the future. Um, so that's groundwater, moving on to sediment transport and morphology. And what we found over there is that there's a net sediment import of typically 34 to 40 kilotons per year. Uh, we find large fluctuations. They are mainly related to the tides. Um, um, and uh, numerical modeling is actually consistent with um, GPS um, observations in the area. Um, what I think is a really interesting find is that the morphological template, so essentially uh, the, the, the template that the construction 
puts over there in terms of the channels and, and, the, and the higher parts. That has a large impact on the rates of morphological change for many years after the initial opening. So if you look carefully over here, you see a limited number of very large channels, but the area seems to like smaller channels much more. So it's essentially nature is kind of reshaping what man has put over there. Um, and that has actually slowed down the morphological evolution of this area quite a bit. Um, but if you go there, you can actually see this process um, still, because I think you can still see the, 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 the template over there of the large channels, but you can also already see the evolution um, of smaller channels. Um, in terms of vegetation development, we found that there's no seed limitation in paddock pollen, uh, but because of the lower elevation, um, we find no vegetation encroachment yet. Um, controlled lab error experiments, they actually show that the seedlings, uh, they would survive best in a well-drained soil without sediment dynamics. And in case there is uh, accretion or, or erosion, that they are more tolerant to the accretion compared to the erosion. So that, that, that tells us something about where they would first essentially encroach. Um, Venter communities, so essentially the bottom, the bottom, uh, bottom life, um, we find that a biologically active intertidal area has formed within three years already after uh, the tidal restoration. Um, and we also find that a development towards a macro infaunal community um, is found that we also see on the nearby Western Skelt tidal flats. Um, and initially it was quite uncertain how long this um, trend would actually, uh, or, or this, this shift would actually uh, take. Uh, but based on these results, we can actually say that this is going to happen within years rather than decades. Um, and also a big plus is that the, the, the area is, is, is regularly visited by birds um, and they can use it uh, for resting uh, and also for feeding. Um, and I think that's also one of the, the big pluses of these, um, these, uh, these, the, these projects. And because they essentially create additional intertidal area and that provides uh, important resting areas for these uh, for these animals. So the summary and the lessons learned of these projects, I think, is uh, that the modern thing has provided really important insights in, in, the, in the morphological and ecological development. Um, I think what is really relevant to this project, to the HPP project, is that the design of the inland is really uh, dominant. Also, the dimensions of the man-made tidal creeks uh, really have a big impact in the years to come. And also, the topography of the tidal flats is still something that can be seen today. Um, we have a unique knowledge obtained on the effectiveness of a seepage installation. Um, and that is really important also in the conversations with the nearby farmers. Uh, and what is really interesting, I think, is that the monitoring is currently continued. Uh, let's say for the next four to five years uh, to see also how these uh, trends evolve uh, in, in, in the medium term. Um, and in addition to the process that I've just sketched you, we will now also focus on, on the socioeconomic sides. Um, we hope that this is really good input for future restoration projects and also adaptive coastal management. To give you a bit of a, of a let's say, a sneak preview of that, um, this, is, uh, this is really the work that is also done in collaboration with Teun Terpsa. That's the Mindscapes bit of coastal transitions. So what we want to do is monitor the perceptions of the landscape during transition phases. Uh, and these landscapes, these coastal landscapes, of course, have a history, an identity. They also have their own traditions and value system. But I, th I think sometimes that we tend to forget a little bit that a physical transition also involves a mental and social transition. Um, and what we want to do here in this part of the research is that we want to benefit from the mul multiple sites that we have in the Southwest Delta and that are in different phases of, uh, of coastal landscape transition. So what can we learn from one site that can also be beneficial to other sites? Um, and we also want to look and include uh, not only the physical and ecological, but also the societal processes. Um, yeah, so we want to look at Parkpol, Ramagors, the Hedwiger Prosper, and also the Suidgors area, which is currently still a, a natural area, and see how people and the community actually perceive these systems and what we can learn from that. So, 
to wrap it up, three take home messages. Um, managed realignment is a soft engineering approach to coastal management, and it essentially mimics what natural coastal systems would do in response to sea level rise. A host of factors are important, um, not only physical and ecological, but also very much societal factors. Um, I very much encourage you to have a look at the paddock folder if you have the opportunity, because I think um, it provides some ideas and thinking also for what's going to happen in the next couple of years in the Head Beef and Prosper. Um, we have already a great data set on it, so I think we can all, uh, and we're happy to share it, so I think we can all, all benefit from that. Uh, and what we already found over there is that broad societal support is really a prerequisite for the implementation of these coastal interventions. And for us, really, the at least a prospect, the, the living lab that we have with with uh, with all the partners now is is really crucial uh, to learn about that, uh, to to experience it, and also to interact and discuss with each other. Thank you. Thank you, Witze. Some people are giving you applause. Other ones are still uh, taking the home message home. Uh, I hope Vana was also uh, interested in the talk. Did you learn something new, Vana? I knew everything. You knew everything. <laughs> but uh, Witze knows how to tell the story better because he's the, the expert yeah. in Vana's realignment. On the other hand, Vana, if no one else asks a question, I will look uh, at you to pop any question for Witze, okay? Uh, now I look around. Any, P, any questions for Witze or HZ in general on uh, some of the topics they were explaining to us? Miron, see. please. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Vito, for the presentation. Uh, just a short question on the, the amount of dredging that needs to be done when you apply managed realignment. Is it expected to increase or decrease when you apply these kind of measures? Well, in a way, I don't think they're really coupled. Um, of course, because the dredging is primarily motivated from the navigation, of course. Uh, um, but theoretically, um, yeah, I, I don't think they're, they're coupled. I think, um, um, in a way, of course, you have the main, the main channel and, and that's probably really needed for the navigation, right? To keep Antwerp open <laughs> and, and connected to the North Sea. And then you have the intertidal areas. And I think, um, if you do manage alignment, they, they can help. Right, because they, they create what, what I explained, uh, more roughness in the system. So that's going to slow your tidal wave down. And that, of course, will, will be beneficial to keep uh, Android safe. Um, but of course, it would be nice if we could start looking at how they can better be connected. Because, of course, uh, managing alignment will allow you to, uh, to create also land level rights. Uh, and that's important in terms of, um, of uh, climate adaptation. But I think for now, there is no connection also in the dredging strategy, uh, but Patrick knows this better. And I think the colleagues from MOW know this, know this generally a little bit better, but um, um, there's no connection between the dredging and what happens on the land, so to say. I think they are essentially two uh, silos. They're, they're not connected, but... No, I was just thinking because your flow velocities are decreasing, you have a less high water level setup. So you would say lower flow velocities, the sediment has more time to settle. So you would have an increase in sediment of sediment in, in, in the, uh, the river basin or in the skelt. So you have to dredge more often, but I'm not sure. Maybe Patrick, uh, do you know about whether that is necessary or not? And your question is whether this uh, managed realignments influence the dredging activities in a negative way so we have to, to dredge more uh, yeah I, I wonder if that would be the case or not i'm not sure um well what we do every four to five years is uh, publishing sediment balances and the western scale is subdivided in different clusters let's say and then we say there's a sediment going from left to right or upstream or downstream um 
I know the signs of the are still the same the last 20 years. So a lot of sand is accumulating towards Antwerp and finer sediments is accumulating towards Antwerp. And there we have a kind of turbidity maximum sedimentation area uh, that is not changing in the last 20 years. Um, the uh, concentrations are changing. So there's more energy in the system. Sediments are being transported easily. Um, and what we are now looking at is how much of the sediment is extra entrained within these tidal marshes, uh, not by studying the activity, the processes in the marshes that are people like Wits are doing, but on following this sediment balance. Eh? Is there some material uh, to close the balance? Uh, how much material do we have to deposit in the, mar in the marshes? Um, but for the moment, this, this uh, amount is, although it's crucial for the uh, sustainability of the marshes, the, the amount of sediment stored there every year is, uh, as compared to the amount of sediment moving, uh, rather small. Okay. Um, so that's what I know from now. Uh, we, we don't see, uh, or we, we are hoping that the material which is not or which is uh, going into the managed realignments, that it's not that it stays there, yeah? and it's it's uh, sustainable. It's a sustainable solution. Um, we are especially looking to minimize the energy, the momentum within the system, so we don't have these high velocities during storms. Uh, so in a way, we are uh, forcing the system to be less uh, dynamic because we see a lot of advantages there. We are not seeing major increase of sediment, of, of uh, dredging activities because of this less dynamic evolution. Uh, we uh, do see there many advantages. Okay. Yeah, add one comment, please. No. Yeah. I've been involved in, in dredging related studies uh, the past 10 years quite extensively. So, in, in the, the lower sea scout, so if you look from our study area uh, upstream, basically the, the main driver of mud uh, resuspension is the dredging of mud uh, inside uh, yeah, the, the fairway itself. And there are some places where mud is being uh, accumulated, but especially in the, uh, in the tidal docks like the Durgang dock, uh, if you uh, are near the site, you see the, the, the port area with the, with the large tidal docks. That generates quite a, a large volume of mud. It is basically being uh, dredged constantly uh, and it is being redeposited uh, inside the skeld near Antwerp uh, on shallow parts and in deeper areas as well. And so if you open this, this tidal area, it will accumulate some of the, the mud that is present in the system. And I think it may decrease some of the mud transport towards uh, the Western Schild, so the Dutch part. But I think overall it will have a yeah, minor impact on the total mud uh, circulation in the lower part of the sea scout, so the Belgian part. Um, and also temporary, eh, probably, because in, in the beginning of the opening of the area, you will have some siltation, which will decrease in rate after some times. And then in the Western Scout, the dredging, it's a different story. There, the dredging is mostly sand, and so it's a, a different kind of dynamics. And there, I think, the, the, uh, the trapping of mud in the tidal flat will not impact uh, yeah, the sand dredging in any way. All right. Thanks. Welcome. I think Ludolf has a question. Uh, thank you, Miran, for the question. Ludolf, you're still raising your hand. Yeah. Probably forgot to lower it, but uh, now I have the time. I, I was interesting, Vitsa and Vana. We're working on a mobile exhibition. And, and one of the things uh, we want to emphasize on work on, on Polder Soucy project, but also want to look back in, in to, the, to the project area. So we maybe want to make either in, in maps or in, in 3D visual recordings, how the, how the little villages with, where disappeared were. But I think 
we also understood that people are interested in how the, the area will develop. Would, would let's say studies you're already doing with Perk Polder and, and what you're doing uh, be of interest that we can make a kind of a program or a kind of uh, image how it, the, the area will look out in, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, something like that? <laughs> or is that, is that kind of a too much a magician uh, approach? Uh, well, I, of course, like um, each, <laughs> each site is different, of course. So I think um, um, it's, it, you can't say one to one, of course, but Perkpol is relatively close, of course, to uh, Hedwiga Prosper. So, of course, it, I think it has some, uh, some value. Um, so in that sense, I think we, we, uh, probably Perkpol is more relevant than Ramagos because Ramagos is, of course, in the, in the Eastern Scalp and that has very different dynamics. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, there might be some, some, some value in actually uh, exploring what we can do over there, definitely. Thanks. I will come back to it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Hazet? There's Philippe. a question. Uh, there's questions in the chat, Patrick. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Philippe yeah, has okay. a question. But, I, see. Uh, I first give Philippe the floor and then I'll look at the chat. Where is the chat? Yeah, Philippe, you can uh, raise your question. Yes, uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, realignment. Uh, in French waterways, uh, we are making research about uh, resonance in site basin. Uh, the water flow in the main channel generates vortices, and we can observe sometimes resonances in this. Uh, site basins so my question was uh, did you did you observe some uh, resonance in uh, in the realigned uh, basin you have created did you observe uh, this kind of um, uh, process yeah um so, so, so we did it as a consortium. So uh, Deltares did the modeling, but I think their modeling was mostly related to sediment transport and not necessarily, I mean, that's of course driven by the hydrodynamics. Um, it's, it's an interesting observation, uh, but I, I don't know actually. Um, a, a, point, a, a, a potentially relevant point, of course, for paddock polder is that the opening is relatively narrow. So I don't know if that limits the opportunity for, for resonance. Um, or, or not. On the contrary, if uh, the opening is narrow, it will generate more resonance. Okay. Um, <laughs> something uh, I don't have the I don't have a good answer for you at, at this point. Um, so we, I, I would need to check with the partner Deltaris if if they found something similar. Uh, but I'm happy to do that if you if, if you if you would want me to pursue that definitely. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Witze, for the honest answer. We have indeed two more questions in the chat. Demos, uh, please, you have the floor. So, uh, did, did you say it to me, uh, Patrick? Or, uh, no, the, the most was there has uh, one question for you regarding. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, I will look, but Demos is still there. Demos, can you raise your question to, to Witze? Yes, please. Uh, I'm just asking about uh, the nature compensation uh, measures. Yeah. Can you elaborate uh, with that one? Yeah, I think <laughs> now we're going into the nitty gritty there. So, right, so I, was, I, was, I was explaining that uh, these mandatory alignment you can you can motivate essentially from an ecological function, right? That the, the ecosystems have declined in the past. Um, and you can also motivate them from uh, climate adaptation, essentially that you create areas along the flanks of estuaries that, that, that can grow with sea level rise. But that's essentially not how these projects that are currently ongoing uh, are motivated. They are essentially motivated from a nature compensation measure for the expansion of the Antwerp 
harbor. So essentially, we've we've all agreed that there needs to be a certain area of uh, a certain value uh, of, of nature in the Skeld system, um, right? That's that's related to Natura 2000 and uh, uh, KWR, Kaderrichtlijn Water. I don't know what the, what the English word is. The uh, Water Frame Directive. Ah, yeah, that's uh, something yeah. like that. <laughs> and and as part of an expansion of the harbor, that needs to be compensated, and that's essentially. Uh, what is happening with these areas. So we see it as a system. Um, it, part of the system um, is used for an expansion of a harbor. We need to compensate that in other part of the uh, of, of the estuary system, essentially. And that, and that is, of course, um, because this is a cross-boundary cross system <laughs> that sometimes leads to interesting discussions. But I, I don't, I don't want to go into too much detail of it. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have uh, some thoughts on that topic before the end of the meeting, Demos. Uh, <laughs> I'll hap I'm happy to uh, give you my, but I don't think it's only my vision on it, but very briefly. Wouter, you also had a question on uh, the idea of uh, can this uh, heightening of these uh, ecological or marsh areas uh, increase the safety? Um, yeah. <clears throat> I don't know which Indeed, uh, because do you... About it, yeah. Yeah, because um, uh, I visit Zeeland uh, uh, quite sometimes each year, and uh, it is uh, uh, striking uh, what the the height uh, different uh, in uh, difference in height is uh, between some parts of the polders in Zeeland, uh, and of course sea level uh, are rising. Uh, so could these uh, natural net deposits be used to? keep up with uh, sea level rising uh, by uh, raising the foreshore or even levees too, or even hinterland. That was my question. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and I think uh, Peter also uh, uh, replied to it in a very uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, short answer. But, but that's essentially, that's really the idea of, the, uh, of, of, these, of these mandatory alignment uh, areas, uh, intermittent polder, exchange polder, it is also sometimes called. Um, if you follow up the sedimentation in these areas, they, they can keep up with sea level rise. Um, um, so yes, that can work, but of course it's a it's a, it's 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 a discussion. It's a, because it also involves a lot of um, relocation of areas. And uh, I, th I think what what is relevant maybe over there recently a study was published by uh, Nios. Um, uh, by Chiat Bauma, in which they also looked at the idea of exchange polder for the entire Western Skeld. Um, but there was, to put it mildly, uh, limited <laughs> in Ceylon. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, let's say, a topic for debate uh, still. <laughs> but potentially the idea could work, yes. Thank you. But so you have to distinguish either you can hire the foreland, but then the actual area where you're living in is still low. Or you can uh, use the river system uh, heightening areas, and then after 50 years, you re-polderize these areas eh? and, and you take them back from the river, but now they are at a higher standard, let's say. So in a way, if you sell it that way, Witsa, maybe the people of Zealand uh, are more... Uh, willing to accept the uh, the yeah, solution. I think, I, I think that was exactly the way it was uh, was sold. Uh, but yeah, still uh, was still not uh, welcomed uh, warmly. I can imagine. I can imagine. I think uh, that Patrick of a whistle polar or exchange polar is is politically in Zealand a, a hot political issue. <laughs> well, in in a way, it's something which which we will face anyway in the next uh, 50 to 100 years, eh? especially in Belgium, not only the, the managed realignment areas will heighten up, but also our, our flood areas will heighten. And in within 50 or 100 years, they, have, they are maybe partially 50% filled with sediments instead of uh, having a water volume, a, a room for water. Uh, so, Either we, we, we will have to do something with these areas. Eh? We can re, uh, we can re give them to agriculture maybe in 100 years. We, we, I don't know. Eh? Uh, okay, any more questions uh, to Hazet and this interesting topic on managed realignments? Um, if not, 
I have one question and then I'll elaborate briefly on the uh, compensations in the Western Scheldt. Seepage installation. Uh, what is this, Witze? It was on one of the slides. You gained information on the effectiveness yeah. of the seepage installation. <laughs> Um, so it's essentially like, so, so what happens, of course, because it used to be a polder, uh, fresh, but now, of course, we let saline water flow in twice daily. So essentially what it's going to mean is that the saline water is protruding more uh, landward, and it's also going to affect the surrounding farmer's land more and more. And to counteract that, a seepage installation, so Quell insulatie uh, was 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 created around the paddock polder area, and essentially what it's doing is it's creating an overpressure of fresh water, and that is done to well essentially to keep in the saline water in the paddock polder area, and not let it easily go to the surrounding freshwater areas. So it's it's a kind of measure against uh, salinity yeah that the, that the, that the yeah, saline okay. water is protruding okay. more and more yeah. into uh, into the farmer's land so essentially you put a, a, a blanket an overpressure of fresh water directly surrounding the paddock polder area and that is to keep the saline water over there essentially um it's quite it's quite a nice insulation you can see it when you go to paddock polder and yeah so it's uh, yeah quite quite Costly, of course, but that's always a balance between uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the costs and the benefits over there. Okay. okay. Perfect. I see it's 10 to 11 or 10 to 10. Um, I think we had an interesting two hours of uh, information sharing and discussion. Um, so for me, this is almost the end. I'll briefly simp uh, give some feedback on the compensation or the management of the Western Scheldt. Um, so the Western Scheldt, as uh, Wietzum has mentioned, is uh, a cross-border border, uh, river. So there's some mutual, it's a, there's some uh, agreement between the Netherlands and the Belgians to manage this river. It's called the VNSC, so it's the Flemish Dutch Scheldt Commission or something like that. And they have a kind of future vision uh, for this area with three goals. We want a sustainable nature uh, functioning, uh, providing different services river. We want uh, an accessible river to all ports. We have, a Dutch, we have two Dutch Belgian ports and we have one additional Belgian port. And we want a safe river protecting ourselves against storms and other uh, nature calamities or hazards. And within this plan or ambition, uh, a lot of goals were set, a lot of projects were defined, a lot of collaboration activities are foreseen. Um, and therefore, if people say, uh, are we doing a mandatory alignment for compensating for the river uh, deepening or widening, um, then I always react that's not the real case, the case is we have a mutual common vision on this river. We are ma maintaining or managing the river together and we have different ambitions. And it's not that we are doing nature, uh, real, natural or managed realignment to compensate any deepening somewhere. No, it's a kind of complete or overall vision for the river uh, with different building blocks. Um, and they interact, of course, they are monitored, they are uh, followed up. And depending on how it's evolving, there are some uh, uh, new activities or things are changed or uh, altered. But in a way, it's a kind of combined uh, ambitions which result in certain activities. So that's, uh, that's the, prop, the, the political correct version of the entire story. OK. Um, I think we're done. Okay, is that true?